Bingo, we're back. One o'clock show on Friday with Peter Hoffenberg. Um, and he's uh, in the history department at UH. Hi, Peter. Hello again, as always. Nice shirt, as always. Okay, disclaimer, yeah. as always. Disclaimer, as always, I'm here to <laughs> represent one of my personalities. But that's it. No institution, no family member. So I'm quite, quite happy to be employed by UH Manoa, but I uh, do not want in any way ruin my colleagues' reputations. So I can do that privately. We've had so many wonderful discussions, but before we start our discussion today, which is about history in the 21st century, um, I just want to do a book review, or rather a movie re review with you about The Boys. Can we talk about that for just a minute? So Our Boys or The Good Boys? Our Boys. Our Boys. Our Boys, of course, yes. But I've only seen the first episode. So. Okay, I've and seen the first seen both. and second. Right, right. And the idea there is that uh, there are three Israeli kids are kidnapped and killed in uh, what uh, in the West Bank, mm -hmm. uh, Hebron. Right, they're, kid me. they're, they're kidnapped the, on the road. The city of Hebron. Right, <clears throat> and and uh, the Jewish uh, settlers there call them settlers. I'm not sure the term they would pick, but mm -hmm. settlers are picked off about that, and uh, they you know they're on the streets and they're really angry, and and there's a vengeance killing of a uh, of an Arab boy who is 16 years old who hasn't done anything bad in his life. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's really, it's in Hebrew, but there are subtitles. You know, with sound on my television, I'd rather have the subtitles if you'd like to know. Um, and it is a very interesting, introspective view of, of the uh, West Bank, of the way the Arabs work, the way the Jews work, their relationship together, uh, and, how, and how they operate in a crisis. Uh, it's a very interesting examination of how the police work uh, in, in, the, in the West Bank, in Israel. I mean, it is really a study of modern day Israel. What did you think of the first episode? The, the first episode, and again, I've only watched the first one, uh, sobering. Uh, your viewers probably know, but just to remind you that even though the dramatizations, the events are true. The three kids yes, were, right. were kidnapped. There was a very long time in which uh, some police knew that they had been murdered, but they kept alive the hope, which is part of the story, right? That all of this hope and if God will return them. So of course, as one policeman reminds us, and true everywhere, not just in Israel, uh, if you pop the bubble of hope, the consequences are actually much greater. And that's one of the things he fears, right? You hope he's alive, you pray to God, you have large rallies, you get people all worked up. And then, of course, when they're not alive, you're really angry. You're in big trouble, as the policeman knows. Uh, the depiction of the uh, Islamic family uh, was, uh, I thought, not just nuanced, but really very honest, because sometimes in the media, uh, Jews and Palestinians and Arabs uh, take on almost these cartoon images. You know, the good Jew, the bad Jew. The good Arab, the bad Arab. And of course, it showed a domestic scene, which could be seen around the world, but made more difficult, of course, uh, by curfews and employment, and how, uh, like many young uh, Palestinians need to do, they need to go into Jewish areas to work. So I don't want to spoil for anybody. But the subplot is, of course, that the kid who is kidnapped, I may or may not be kidnapped because he works in Israel. Right. right, he may or may not be kidnapped. I don't want to destroy everything for your viewers. But here's clearly a, a kid who um, is able to, when things are fine, go to this other area, but is vulnerable as a, as a young boy. And I think it shows that, um, like in places such as uh, Northern Ireland, um, Sri Lanka, uh, parts of the United States, uh, the zealots and extremists are on both sides, and sometimes the uh, police and the state are, are caught unprepared. I mean, the, the story on the Jewish side is about a unit in the police department which is supposed to be watching for Jewish extremists. That's what they do. They don't watch for Palestinian extremists, they watch for Jewish extremists. And just think of all the pressure on a, on a policeman like that, right, who's responsible for targeting, surveilling, arresting, Fellow Jews, not, not uh, Muslims, Palestinians. And I remember, of course, a lot of Palestinians are Christians, so Palestinians are, are Arabs as well. And also, just as television, it's, it's superb. It is there's, superb. It's, there's good dialogue. Uh, there's time where nothing is said, which is perfect. Uh, the young boy, uh, the young Jewish boy who's searching for himself, you see this in his eyes. You see he's lost and searching. It's just a very well done, well done show. I wouldn't say for the emotionally squeamish. Is there are definitely ups and downs and yanks here and there. But the, the violence is not visible. Uh, 
That's, except, except in the crowd setting. Right. Yeah. But that's one of the powerful things about, about that film. It's yeah. a lot of the violence we never see. You know, we, we as individuals very rarely ever see yeah. the violence. Yeah. What, and what makes it uh, interesting, too, is that this is a CIS kind of thing. You, the Israelis are using technology, uh, mm -hmm. all kinds of advanced technology to, to solve the crime. They don't know. Uh, and they're using psychology, too, to solve mm -hmm. the crime. So it's, it's good police work. And ultimately, I, I don't know the end of the story yet, but ultimately I'm sure they did solve mm -hmm. the crime. Uh, they did. Yeah. And um, the culprits, again, not to spoil it for everybody, um, were who you thought they would, they would be. It was, a, it was a revenge murder. And yeah. revenge is almost on people's lips the minute the kids uh, are reported missing, not just killed, but the idea of mm -hmm. revenge. One of the characters makes a comment is, is they were not kidnapped to be returned. They were kidnapped to be killed, right? which is sad. It is sad. The Israelis, though, are uh, equally accustomed to the opposite, which is a Hamas uh, kidnapping an Israeli soldier and using the soldier as an exchange or something like that. This was you know, outright murder. Yeah. 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 Worth, worth seeing. Um, uh, well, it's, it's on HBO, as I recall. Right. We're not allowed to advertise, so it's on a cable network. Right? <laughs> okay, if you wish. <laughs> right. Well, it's a good segue to yeah. our discussion today. Our discussion today is looking at it from the point of view of a history professor. You know, we are in a time that's different. And you can disagree. You may very well disagree. Partially the different. Time sure, I don't entirely disagree. In my, no. in my observation right. than any time in the past, at least in modern civilization anyway. Here we are in the 21st century, and there are things that are happening that were really unpredicted and unpredictable. Um, and they are moving so quickly. And, and you wonder whether this can be a straight line. Maybe history is never a straight line, Peter. Where do you think we are on the continuum? Uh, moving rapidly towards extinction, I would say. Extinction? Extinction. No, not at all. I'm not, I'm not a pessimist. I'm a realist. So I would agree with you and disagree with you. Since we're old friends, we can do both. I, I think that it is a fully rational and fully acceptable uh, to think that things are very different. They certainly seem to be very different and to think that they could not have been predicted. And I think that's, that is a truth. Uh, the other truth is, and they really coexist, that uh, most people uh, cannot predict. Remember, economic companies that do well predict successfully 25 or 30% of the time. So to look back and say, well, you know, uh, the election of Barack Obama should have prepared us for this, or uh, the Iranian revolution or whatever should have, uh, at least historians and most political scientists are not really in the business of predicting one answer. So I would agree with you. It perceives to, seems to be very different. And part of that's for good reasons of technology, et cetera. Um, and two, it is difficult to predict. Now, on the other hand, and they, and they can clasp. They're not fighting. Their hands are clasped. Uh, much of what we are experiencing has been part of modern history, at least. And modern is a very problematic term. but uh, certainly, it's, it's much of history in last, the last two, 250 years. And of course, there were people who predicted these kinds of cataclysms. Uh, but often, you know, when you predict something like that, you're offering, off, often predicting it um, based on speculation or based on a single hard theory. So if one wanted to say Marx predicted this, and he ended up predicting a lot of things correctly, but not everything correctly, right? And, but the criticism of Marx would have been in part that he had a, a one simple theory, you know, and that simple theory could predict everything. Or George Orwell. I mean, we all are quoting Orwell these days. These days we they care are, more about him than we did before. Right, <laughs> uh, but he would also remind us that, that uh, if we simplistically care about him and simplistically swallow what he said, we're actually guilty of what he was worried about. Yeah. We need to be as critical of Orwell, while appreciating Orwell, as critical of the things that we use Orwell to criticize. So as usual, and I apologize again to your audience, I can't say everything is new. It's not. Some things are new, most certainly. And some people uh, remind, for example, um, you know, Verne predicted spaceships and Verne predicted helicopters and airplanes, but not, they didn't turn out to be the way he thought, and he didn't know all the science, right? So you could go back well to, if I had read Jules Verne, you know, would there never have been aerial bombings in Vietnam? We might have not had, I, that's kind of an absurd 
you know, a little, little exercise. Now, I think what you're, in way, what you're asking me in part is what's new, right? And well, what's I'm asking, not new. I'm asking you about um, vectors and factors and influences that we could identify now, which, are, which never existed before. I'll give you two of them mm -hmm. that, that come to mind for me. Uh, and maybe these are two of the most important. One is we have technology now that was um, unpredictable 20 years ago. Not, not necessarily in the technology or in the function of the technology, but in the effect of the technology. Mm -hmm. If I told you 20 years ago that everybody would be strapped together, not only to be able to talk to each other, but that would have an effect on, on, on mass thinking, on group thinking, on global thinking, on global action, uh, that, you, know, that you, you might not have you know, seen that coming. Um, so what we have is speed and we have influence of the technology. The second one, we can go one by one here. The second one is the, the decline of the planet environmentally in terms of climate change, which you know, a lot of people you know, resist that and, and reject it and all, but the fact is, little by little, if not every day, and soon enough, uh, every hour, <laughs> we're mm -hmm. all gonna figure out this is going to change our lives. Yeah, we'll be doing the this show with Storkel in about yeah, right. 15 yeah, years. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that means you know, a lot of people are going to die, maybe in the billions, um, that will change things. Uh, and, and this could be coming relatively mm -hmm. soon, you know, the way it's sort of logarithmically increasing. So those two things come to mind. So let me ask you, were those things predictable? Were those things happening, you know, before um, and influencing the way humanity worked? Okay, again, let me give you, um, the first answer is a philosophical one. <laughs> because uh, when one asks, you know, did it happen before, uh, was it predictable, et cetera, you're asking a certain degree, is there an equivalency? No. We saw this in the recent debate over what to call the migrant center. They're, it, they're not equivalent. So were there catastrophic environmental events or similar events? Yes. Uh, were there technologies which, as you say, had unprecedented speed and influence? Yes. Now, they were not equivalent, but we could say they were similar to analogies. So what a historian would say is everything's unique. Some things are precedented, some things are unprecedented, but how they play out depends upon really two things. Mm -hmm. And this is one third thing I would add to your list. One is the context, which we all of us have known, the time and place, and your viewers will be familiar with that. I think the third thing I would, might add to your list is um, the use of the past or the significance of memory. And Orwell did worry about this. So when I say how we think about the past, mm -hmm. well, we often think about the past in light of the present, or what we think we thought happened in the past. Fake history, like fake news. Okay, so I would add that. So of your, of your three, let's go to the first one. I think um, <clears throat> this computer age, so we go back even 25, 30 years, is unprecedented. But the way in which you phrase those very important problems are not unprecedented. The middle of the 19th century, in which there was a telegraph, an explosion in the West of literacy, daily newspapers, the response would be actually very similar. Look at the speed. Um, 150 years ago, when there was a rebellion in uh, East, uh, East India colonies, it took six to eight months for British troops to get there. Sepoy Mutiny of 1857, the British knew it was happening in two days. But that's because of the technology. Right now, it's not, I can pick up my phone and know what happened a nanosecond ago. That's true. Okay. But there are societies which have had to deal with quantum leaps in the speed of information. And then, very much in how the information is used. Should somebody in the 19th century read the information privately and reflect upon it? And or should the information be expressed publicly at a meeting, read out loud? Today is the anniversary of the Peterloo Massacre, where a newspaper was read out loud. And that is similar, we can see, in a way to you know, social Different media. Effect. Right. Effect. And the, effect, the feared effect was, using the language of the time, you know, irrationality and hysteria. In between is a very significant moment in history, and that's the 1920s and 1920s where radio was used. Every significant leader, every significant political movement 
used radio. And radio is kind of the middle ground between the iPhone and the newspaper. Now, it was radio for a fireside chat of reflection. The political leader is entering into your home, telling you there are only four fears. And or, right, is the radio to be used to rally people to act? There are those in Germany who did that. Of course, and India, Gandhi, Father Coughlin here. Um, if you ever, I'm sure you've seen, but if you see it again, please see The Great Dictator. And the penultimate scene of The Great Dictator has Charlie Chaplin, who has been mistaken for the dictator. He's the Jewish uh, barber. The mustache. Right, using, though, <laughs> using the technologies of radio and mass assemblies, not to get people to kill, but to get people to stop killing. And so there's a brief moment where he realizes that he's using the same technology that the fascists and authoritarians are using for a democratic purpose. But how are you going to turn that off? How are you going to turn off FDR's cry for war from stealing your Japanese American neighbor's uh, property? Yeah. Right? And, and, that, and Chapel, uh, Chaplin, excuse me, there's a brief moment where he looks at you and with his eyes, and he says basically, boy, boy, I'm doing what my enemy is doing for world peace, but how, is, how am I going to be able to make sure? You know, it's like Lincoln in the second inaugural address. We're at war. How am I going to make sure the end of war will mean an absence of malice? Right? I've turned on the spigots, and what we know is the spigots are very difficult to turn off. But that's true of any... Technology. The technology, right. the power of right. it, all now the second, effects. The second one you asked me about, an environmental cataclysm. Uh, we could look back and look at, for example, the Great Plague, the bubonic plague, which was not strictly uh, environmental, but it was demographic. Mm -hmm. And we can begin to understand uh, that. Uh, great massive fires in the Middle Ages and the early modern era um, which turn the skies of London, for example. We, wanna, we wouldn't want to you know, exclude, however, um, mass disease in the 21st century. Right. And then it's the, not just environmental. No, right. And humans have experienced mass we, disease we, before. Right. Absolutely. In 1918, right. was it? A huge flu epidemic killed hundreds of thousands of well, people. Well, more people died from the uh, influenza after the First World War, probably, than died during the war. Yeah. At least so, it's very close. And we could have... Uh, and that was, you know, that was worldwide. That was SARS a global... SARS or other, some sure. other kind of highly infectious now, disease. I think probably, though, um, I certainly would not... I mean, and I fundamentally agree with you. I'm just sort of tweaking at the edges, as historians try to do, to say that not everything is quite new. Uh, probably, though, um, considering the knowledge we have of the animal and plant world, I don't think humans have ever uh, stood at the precipice of such natural extinction. I'm not necessarily talking about water and glaciers per se, but uh, you know, the United Nations declaring that 25% of a certain you know, birds will die or what have happened to the bees. I don't, I would have to talk to my friends in environmental history and, an, and animal history, but that seems to be, first of all, we have much more knowledge now of the natural world than we ever did before. <clears throat> and that seems to me to be uh, uh, one of those moments where, uh, no, we don't really have precedent that I know of for the extinction, the significant extinction. I mean, there have always been extinctions, but I mean a, a massive extinction. You know, it's almost as if you were a cro or Neanderthal and you're looking at the last woolly mammoth. I mean, what, what, would, what would be your reaction? Okay. And, we're, and we're in, we are eating on that edge in some well, cases, most uh, certainly. You know, I'm thinking that one of the elements that goes into that, you, you say we have knowledge, we have knowledge of the environment, of water, of food, what have More you. More so, I think, than humans have ever had. More which is not to, had. not to disparage other societies, but, but we just... Our problem is yeah. acting together. There are more of us, um, mm -hmm. and the political will seems uh, elusive, um, not only here, but elsewhere. Governments come apart so easily, make the wrong decisions to affect everyone so, so easily. And so, uh, you know, the question I, I'm left with after that is, okay, uh, so we have the technology to, to provide water, to provide, uh, you know, food. This goes back to Flint, Michigan, mm -hmm. and it goes back to Detroit in the news this week about clean water. And Newark. 
It's and, a shonda. And thank you. It's and a shonda. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if you're yeah, in the yeah, audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're all speaking. Yeah, they're all it's speak it's yeah, they're all yeah. Yiddish speaking <laughs> think tech, the Yiddish speaking show. No, no it's, it's a shonda. It's a so crime. So, with a shame. lack of political will, right. you know, you cannot apply the technology and you get lead in the water. Uh, you know, this is really tragic that we have it, but we can't use it. It's biblical, even, you know. Uh, so I, I think would, that's a, a fact that we have to consider. A absolutely. Um, the response is, and again, in complete agree with, with you, um, that has always been the case. That people, <laughs> uh, no, but I mean, I want to twist a little bit so that's, because uh, that's banal. Always watch out when but, you say you, you agree with me. Right, I know. Uh, <laughs> everybody back home will remind me not to. Now, I'll wear a t-shirt next time. Uh, unfortunately, historically, uh, that these kinds of shandas happen to minority groups and low-income groups. Now, but that's a banal claim. The non-banal claim is that the modern world is one in which there's supposed to be a social contract. That even if you were a minority, and even if you were poor, basic uh, resources and the basic human condition. I mean, when FDR says, you know, you should be free of want, or that I apologize free of want. So regardless of your race, your creed, your ethnicity, your income level. So I agree with Saturday you. Saturday evening post. Right. Norman Rockwell. <laughs> okay, but it, but it is a Shonda when people in this uh, world, this country, world even, can go without water, but certainly. So I think the difference is, and, and the difference has fueled what we might want to talk about some other time, you know, populism and authoritarianism. It's been fueled by a social promise and a social pact which has been ignored or broken. Uh, Gellner, a very famous sociologist, in his, in his usual bold and unapologetic terms, called this social bribery. Right? I'm gonna participate in this society, and I'm gonna participate in this polity, not as equals, right? I mean, they, they, it's not as equals, we know that. But as having at least, right, at least a floor of human decency, right? So, I know that I'm never going to become Bill Gates. Uh, I know that I am of a, a privileged race. I know all that. Um, so the responsibility is to recognize that there are uh, minimum standards. And we have seemed to be having a difficult time. Housing should be a minimum standard. Healthy food, clean water, not just a job. We seem to be obsessed with the job. Um, and it doesn't have to be a decent job always, but a job that pays, you know, health insurance. These are basic. And if we go back in history of the Cold War, remember these were all the things that Khrushchev and Kennedy and Nixon and Brezhnev would fight over because the Soviet Union would say, of course, we well, do all that, which they didn't, of well, course, but they could say they so did. interesting. Yeah. And one factor that's in play here is that we had a, a pretty high moral standard during the Depression. Um, you know, freedom from want and Norman Rockwell and. Mm -hmm. and FDR, and those guys raised up the country in their own way to a, a higher moral level of decency. Uh, now we, we reject a lot of that. I mean, or the government does anyway. I don't know how. Well, that's part of the difficulty. There's always been a populist, um, anti-elite, anti-expert uh, tone. Um, Hofstetter wrote a lot about it as kind of a uh, politics or culture resent, right? Mm -hmm. Resent New York, mm -hmm. resent Hollywood, mm -hmm. et cetera. Is that uh, the guy who seems to be successful? Right. Uh, but <clears throat> people inside of government generally were not like that. <laughs> I mean, unfortunately, in a lot of our governments around the world now, we have people who uh, resent all of that science and that management in government itself. So you could understand the gap between the best and the brightest, as David Halberstam would say, and the rest of common people. You can understand that. But what happens when the best and brightest wield power and wield money and deny science, deny rationality, deny the enlightenment of equality. And that's not reserved. I, again, probably most listeners, and naturally so, would think of the United States. That's not reserved, the United States. That's part of uh, an authoritarian populism that's India, uh, Hungary, uh, fuels Brexit. I mean, really, what you, you can dislike being part of the European well, Union, a... but you know, the idea that you can go it alone. Well, it's a great segue, yeah. because what we have now, uh, and by the way, this all reminds me of Herman Wouk's book, mm -hmm. The Winds of War. Uh, yep. And the movie, it was actually a TV serial right. with lots of episodes. Right. Robert Mitchum and Ali McGraw, 
and how they traveled around Europe in their respective roles. Like she was a student, uh, and he was a naval officer, mm -hmm. U.S. naval officer, and uh, and they they butted into each other once in a while. Um, but mostly, you you know, you followed uh, the decline of of Europe, the mm -hmm. decline of decency, um, and and the imminence of war. Uh, it was different than World War One, the way it came about. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, nobody liked each other, and they, or at least the Germans didn't like anybody, and they were... Nobody liked the Germans either. Nobody yeah. liked the Germans, <laughs> yeah. okay. Still probably the case. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, no. So, <clears throat> but, but the bottom line is uh, you could tell it was coming. Right. And uh, right now we have, we have countries like Russia, um, we, have, well, we have Trump, who like to divide people, who like to make them angry at each other, in the thought, I mean, there's a method about the madness, in the thought that they will be stronger if the people they're dividing are weaker. So if I go to Sweden, for example, an article about uh, uh, Sweden with various groups of liberals and not so liberals in Sweden arguing with each other about migrants. Right. And, you know, and, and clearly, and they found evidence to suggest that Russia was fomenting that divisiveness. So what you have is that some people like to create divisiveness on the part of other people and get a leg up on them and undo undo the functionality, the effectiveness of their long-standing society. I don't know if that's happened before. That seems like a new one for me. And it seems also that the hate, the racism, mm -hmm. all that stuff, it seems like that is a, that is a, a, um, an introduction to the, the winds of war. Um, th that means that people aren't getting along. They're not looking to collaborate. They're not looking to make friends and do things uh, you know, in collaborative groups, they, they just all mad at each other. Populism, nationalism, whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the problem I get with that is I think that's as much a relevant um, phenomenon right now uh, as, um, uh, and immigration, by the way, is involved in that, uh, as, as climate change or technology gone amok uh, or some of the other things we've talked about. That is a factor that mm -hmm. could change the world pretty quickly. Uh, we're, I think we're on the brink of war in various places, not to say that each place will go to war, but one of them, all we need is one of them. Right, you know? and then situations such that a mistake can cause war now. And things yeah. are so intense. Um, I think the unprecedented nature of that is that we have dismantled uh, a, a, an imperfect, admittedly imperfect international order after 1945. And I'm not here to extol the virtues of the World Bank or the IMF. United Nations, they can do that themselves. But there was a structure. There was, there was a, a structure, a, a Keynesian structure, and a recognition that that really revolved around the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, again, imperfect, not equal by any means at all. Um, that has been dismantled. Um, it's been dismantled in part because, again, it didn't fulfill all of its promises. Uh, it's been in part uh, dismantled because of the rise of other uh, wannabe great powers. Uh, again, I'm not picking on anybody, but uh, China plays a major role in this. In 1945, remember, there was uh, a weakened China. There was really no, no China uh, in the sense of being a political entity. Uh, after 49, there became two Chinas at least. So the participation in China, and again, not, not to blame China, but that's clearly uh, influenced things. The um, failure of larger, uh, multi-ethnic states, which also are part of that 1945. I think we'll look back, my grandchildren will look back, and they'll see really the, the end of Yugoslavia as one of the warning signs. You know, we don't talk about it too much anymore. It was a multi-ethnic state. It was not held together by a Democrat by any means at all. A populist authoritarian figure who did practice social bribery, though. The, yeah. Croatia, yeah, the Croatians and the Serbs. And he was able to play off the U.S. and the United States. He had a mixed economy, which is not to say I have a Tito T-shirt by any means at all. But I think we'll look back and see the failure, the failure of Yugoslavia, which also had Russian and American intervention in it, right? The Russians came to help their, their Slavs, their fellow Slavs, which they had done for centuries and centuries. Uh, that was kind of prescient about what was happening. Now, the question would be, and that's happening all over the world. The question would be, though, whether that happening all over the world will, like in 1941, become a world event. And world War II was not a world war until 1941. Ten years of vicious violence in all the different theaters. So that's, as a historian of the 20th century, that's what I look 
look at them. Do you see this as a, as a phenomenon, a, a course of events that's repeating itself? After all, you know, we have North Korea shooting missiles, uh, and, and Trump's discussions with them are meaningless. Um, we, have, uh, we have rioting in Hong Kong at a level we've never seen before, uh, such a threat to uh, China, and China, you know, uh, organizing its armed forces to, uh, on the border in Shenzhen. Um, we have 65, 70 million people now in homeless camps, uh, you know, uh, migrant camps around the world behind barbed wire. We have, we have um, a general decline, I would say, of law and order, if you want to call it. We, look at this country. We have a shooting every few days, most recently at the police themselves. Um, so, you know, what I get is we, we're in a process. And as you say, it may not result in, in a war or a, you know, a debacle, and that, a global debacle tomorrow, but it shows you a trend, doesn't it? The trend is there. I don't see, um, I don't see right now the equivalent, say, for example, of uh, Pearl Harbor or the Soviet invasion of, uh, sorry, excuse me, the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. Boy, that was a... a <laughs> I, I, forgot, I ran out of sleep. I forgot, so in other words, I forgot to mention, you know, we have, the we're triggers. tearing up nuclear treaties. Right. Now, I was going to say, uh, apropos of your previous comment, that, in, that does endanger the world. And, of course, one of the things that held the world together uh, between 1945 and, we hope, forever will be the only two tragic uses of nuclear weapons. Now, I would, I would be worried about that. I would be worried about India and Pakistan, mm. et cetera. Mm. But as I say, which is not, <clears throat> not to be an optimist by any means at all, I don't see the, the trigger mechanism. I don't see quite the, the competition between China and the US as exactly equivalent. Remember, we're talking about equivalencies, not analogies, to the tensions between Japan and the US in the 30s. And that helped trigger, of course, World War II. And I don't see uh, the tension between a significant expansionary Central or Western European power and the Soviet Union. And that's, of course, what triggered the invasion of 1941. So just as a historian trying to find what's the same, what's different, mm -hmm. I'm as depressed as you are with your description. You made me even more depressed. I'm going to go home and finish my bottle of Slivovitz. But... Uh, my depression might be yeah, my depression might be even deeper, and I also don't see a solution. In other words, Syria, if we look at Yugoslavia, we're also going to look at Syria. All those years where really nobody did anything, and in the end, what's happened? In the end, the dictator has won. Well, I know we didn't like all the opponents of the dictator. I understand that. It's complicated in that way. He's won. He's won with his sort of, uh, the assistance of Russia. In Iran, and his victory and stability now, in some ways, has made it at least more recognizable for Netanyahu to deal with Syria. So, but think of think of the dead. Mm. That Syria used to be, you know, in the nineteen yeah late nineteenth twentieth century, just like Beirut. Yeah, these A were garden. great. These are great cosmopolitan. And Beirut was the Paris of uh, the Levant. Yeah, and um, so. I am. I worry, but I don't. I don't. I neither see a uh, global conflagration. I don't see that, and I hope. I hope that I'm right on this one. But I also, um, even though I'm generally a hopeful person, I, I don't see um, a resolution to a lot of these issues because I think that the uh, political world and the institutional world have failed. So it's going to take something that I used to never talk about or even think of that important, uh, but, I'm, but I'm changing my mind about it. Uh, it's going to take uh, society, not government. Uh, in the Middle East, it's going to take uh, NGOs and families who cross, cross the border and have their kids go to school with each other. Uh, here in the United States, it's going to take, uh, I, I, I don't want to discourage people from voting by any means at all, but it's, it's going to take um, like, uh, I'll show you a video a friend of mine sent me, this wonderful uh, black uh, musician who uh, didn't even understand racism until he returned from Germany. And he has spent his entire life, his, his non-professional life, meeting Klan's members, talking to them. Now he's brave, he's big, helps being big, brave and bright. And that's not a government program, right? That's, there's not an institution. It's a brave person who has decided, I'm, I'm going to make this effort. And let's be honest, equally brave Klansmen 
were saying, all right, you know what? Maybe all this stuff is stupid. You know, mm. maybe I don't need this. Mm. Maybe I'd like to get along mm. with this guy. It's going to take both sides, right? I mean, it's going to take Israelis and Jews making some concessions. And but I think what the bottom line is is people uh, have to be able to, as Adam Smith wrote a lot about this, you have to have trust, right? So if the African American musician goes into the guy's house. He knows their weapons in the house. He has to trust that the person will not use them. Right? Yeah. The Palestinian is going to have to trust if I go to the Jewish section of Jerusalem, you know, I'm not going to be kidnapped. Or the police station. Right. And that gets boys, back to yeah. some of your earlier points that social media would have it differently, right? Social media would say, oh, the kid's there. Let's go, right, let's go get him, right? Or the authoritarian populist would say, uh, you know, he or she is different. So it's going to have to take trust. There used to be more trust in government. There was always reason to be, you know. Would you agree with me that for a solution, if you, if you were king, I mean, in the full capacity of that, you would want in this country to reform government, major reformation. Because government right now doesn't work. Uh, government doesn't regulate. Government doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't support decency. Government doesn't do anything right now. Uh, and furthermore, if, if you were king, and, and I made you king soon, you would have a certain number of things to do. You would get back on climate change. You would, you would ease up on this immigration. You wouldn't do anything to create hatred in the country. Uh, you, would, you would support relations with other countries, and you would support other countries uh, in the same sense of decency. You would do a bunch of things. And, and I think we have learned in the 21st century, or in the, 19th, or in the 20th, um, that a leader, a negative leader, can have huge effect on people. That the stories of decency, the stories of courage that you describe, they're anecdotal. If you want to have them happen on a large scale, involving hundreds of millions of people, billions of people, people look naturally to a leader, however he got there. And so we need leaders. You know? So if you're a leader, don't you think you could find a solution to our current predicament? I would hope so. Uh, first of all, I'd get rid of the designated hitter rule and all of AstroTurf. <laughs> No, I, I think I, I don't disagree with you, I, although I think that um, being the son of <clears throat> two people of government, there are a lot of good people in government, a lot of people. Um, there are institutional questions, but certainly everything you said is a floor, right? A decent leader, a leader who unites rather than divides. But I think you've seen with um, the, current, the current authoritarian figures, be they kings or wannabe kings, we got to take a step back because either one looks up to them for the wrong reasons, right? Uh, for example, um, should we look up to a leader because of his or her race? That's, so we kind of have to step back, right? If we're going to have a democracy and you're going to vote for people. And that means trust. It means seeing that everybody's identity is very complex. It can't be reduced to religion or race or gender. It's very complex. Every society is, co is complex, and that's a step before voting, or a step before politics. Does this, mean, <clears throat> does this mean, Peter, that we can come back and have this conversation Absolutely. again? And I'll have many different identities for you. Yeah, Absolutely. And, and maybe, you, maybe you'll agree with at least some of the things. And, uh, we'll I've agreed with a surprising number of things. I know, I know you things. have, and I, actually, I didn't have enough sleep last night. I, I know. I, I, I make a little bit wrong with me. I, well, you know, he agreed on this. He, I know. You know, I know. The, the cantankerous Jew is gone. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you. Always thank a you pleasure. So much, Peter. Yeah, I can get my voice back next time. Peter Hoffman. Thank you. Historian extraordinaire. <laughs> thank you.